your word and for your glory in Jesus name Amen 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 if you turn in your Bibles then to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 when I was preparing for this I thought right we'll, I, I'm going to try uh, my, my endeavour would be to do one point sermons so I normally do like generally three points or four points I thought I'll do one point sermon but, um, but as I looked at this first passage of scripture I thought I don't know if I can do a one point sermon because if it was one point it would be this we are children of wrath I mean that means the point that you would go away with today is we are by nature under God's um, judgment and I thought really we don't want to be coming to church and going away knowing that all we've heard is that we're under God's judgment by nature the next verse that's in verse 3 the next verse says this but God because of his great who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us made us alive I thought, how can I preach the one without the other? And if I did um, preach the one without the other, if I did the next one, like next week or whenever it is I'm preaching next, you'll have forgotten about the previous one. And now here's the thing. I've heard this passage preached on a, a number of occasions over the years. And what I've noticed is that people invariably emphasise his great love for us. And that's good and right, and we're going to spend time thinking about that. But <coughs> Ephesians, the whole letter of the Ephesians, you know, it's all about God and his glory and his church. That's, that's what it's about. So if you look in Ephesians chapter 1, just in the first um, couple of, in the first verse, it says, To God's holy people in Ephesus. He's writing not to individuals, but to the church. In Ephesus and in that first chapter we read it this morning or we read some of it this morning three times it tells us about the you know, God's big plan his overall plan and it tells us that God's done it all for the praise of his glory everything that God's done everything that he's doing all that he continues to do in our little lives and through us he's doing for his glory he wants to be glorified and he will be glorified and here's the thing, we cannot, we cannot appreciate the glory of God without understanding where we are at naturally with him and where he is at. We can't. I don't know if you've ever noticed, it's difficult, isn't it, sometimes to love God. We know that we ought to love him, we ought to love him more. It's difficult sometimes to, have, to, to, to feel affections towards God sometimes isn't it I'm sure I'm not the only one and we struggle to appreciate God when George and I were praying it just you know struck me that I just don't appreciate God I just don't appreciate what he's done for me if I did I would live quite differently a lot of the time and I don't and so we need to to appreciate the love of God we need to appreciate where we were at and where we are at naturally with him because it's when we see the, 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 our, our fallenness and our sinfulness and we see that he loves even us that we begin to see the measure of his overwhelming love and uh, so, so that's the first thing that we uh, so it's got to be at least a two point sermon this morning and the second thing is this when I was preparing I, it you know, it actually genuinely scared me in two ways when I was preparing. Genuinely, it scared me the, the reality of our natural state. That scared me. And it scared me that I've got to preach it. It scared me. And I thought, Lord, I, I can't really preach that. You know, it's hard. And... Um, and I'm not saying I'm courageous because I'm not, but it takes courage to say what I'm going to say to you this morning. But as, as I was thinking about it, I knew, I knew I have to be faithful to God 
I have to be faithful to him because it's his word. And he has called me as his servant to preach his word, not to pick and choose the bits that I want. And uh, so I say that to you by, by way of warning, really. Because Ephesians chapter 1 deals with our big problem, with the big problem. Now, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, I wanted to illustrate it in a way that's not too personal for any of us. So, uh, but you can then personalise this for yourself, okay? Um, but imagine, this is to illustrate the, pro- the, co- the nature of the problem that we're looking at this morning. Imagine, okay, um, a pastor of a church and someone comes to him and, uh, yeah, he's a an approachable kind of pastor, the sort of person that people feel they can talk to. And and, and a man comes to him, visits him in the church building and says to him, Pastor, can I speak to you? And Pastor says, yes, you can speak to me. And he says, well, he says, what is it? He says, well, I want to know how I can be more generous with my money. Because I feel like, you know, I'm not really very generous, not as generous as I should be. And when it comes to it, I, I, I tend to not, you know, give as I should. And as he was speaking to the pastor about this, the pastor saw in this man that, you know, there were, he was asking about being more generous, but that there was some angst in his voice. It, there was some, a degree, of, there was something more than what the man was presenting. Okay? And um, so the pastor said to him, well, um, how do you use your money? He said, well, that's part of the problem, I, I, I don't use my money very well. And he said to him, well, what do you use your money on? He said, well, I've, I've used some of my money on, uh, on gambling, and I've used some on just my own leisures and pleasures, and I just know that you know, I really ought to use it in a, in a better way. And the pastor looked at him and, and thought, well, he's been honest there, but there's something about him. You know, you could just see there's, there's more. And he said, is there something you want to tell me? And the man looked down to his feet and he said to him, where did you get that money? And the man said, I got it from my pension fund. He said, what, you drew it, you got the money out of your pension fund? He said, no. He said, I took it from other people's pension funds. And now I feel really bad and I want to give the money away in a way that is going to honour the Lord. And so the pastor thought to himself, oh dear, how am I going to, yeah, he's come to me with a problem. As far as he's concerned, he just wants to be more generous because he feels bad and he wants to give this money away. But actually there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is how now is, are we going to deal with this? Because this man is going to need to confess which means possibly a prison sentence. Devastation for his family coming clean. So he he had one problem, but there was a bigger problem. But, now I'm sure we all have all sorts of issues and difficulties and challenges and from time to time problems. Sometimes there are bigger problems. And those bigger problems often um, trouble us, like they're troubling this man. And maybe you have an issue that's troubling you, something you've not really talked about, something that you know is wrong. But let's just stay with the story for a moment longer. Because as the pastor is thinking to himself, okay, how do I pastor this man? How do I help him and stand with him through what is going to be a difficult time? All of a sudden, they hear a shout. There's a bomb! There's a bomb! And in the, um, not the attic, what's the under, basement. There's a bomb in the basement. Run. Now, all of a sudden, there's another problem, right? But this problem is a much bigger problem than the other problems. In fact, this problem means those other problems really don't, they're not the issue, right? And here's the thing. This was a bomb that had been ticking away for some time. And they had no awareness of it. None. There was a a bomb coming, and they didn't even know. They thought they knew what their problems were, but actually there was a bigger problem, a much bigger problem. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us about the bomb. 
There is a bomb. Whatever problems, whatever challenges you might think you have, there is a bigger problem, a bigger challenge, a major one. One that means all your other problems, relatively speaking, are, well, I wouldn't want to say insignificant because they're not insignificant, but compared to, they're just not such an issue. Let me apply it to the, our text, which we'll, we'll c come to, like this. So the Bible tells us that one day we have to give an account to God and that he will judge us all. Bible's clear about that in the book of Acts chapter 17. For he has appointed a day when he will judge the world by, his, by the one he has chosen, Jesus. There's a day of judgment coming. And in Matthew 25, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And those that he refers to as goats will go off into everlasting destruction. On that day, that moment when we find ourselves standing before God, there will have been things in our lives that we will have wished we put right when we could. Think of this man who's wanting to avoid dealing with his, what he perceives to be his big problem in order to make himself feel better. Do you know, if he was to hold on to that problem, he would realise one day that with all the outfall of it in this life, that actually it wasn't worth holding on to. He should have dealt with it. He'll know then. He will regret for all eternity that he didn't deal. He didn't confess the big problem. He didn't deal with it with God, firstly. Do you see the... The point in Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at what it says. As for you, now just before we go any further, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church. Okay, this is the church. Now we live in an individualistic society where we tend to think in terms of me and I rather than we and us. But Paul isn't writing to individuals, he's writing to the church. And he's speaking to all those that make up the church. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, to the church. Well, actually, it doesn't say the church in Ephesus. It says, to the faithful in Christ in Ephesus. But that's the church. He's right, this went to churches. And he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That is, every single person that makes up the church, all true believers, were dead in their transgressions and their sins. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But then it says something else. In which you used to, what does it say, anyone know? Live. You were dead in the way you used to live. Okay, so he's saying that you were, you're not anymore, but once you were dead in the way that you used to live. And he goes on, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And then the next verse it says, all of us also lived among them at one time. So he's saying, he's speaking to the church, he's saying this is the way that you were. So he's speaking about the way that they were. But, this applies to every unbeliever too. Because the way that every believer was is the way that every unbeliever is. And he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We had the illustration earlier with um, Alex laying on the ground pretending to be dead. Now, when I was a boy, I remember yeah, I never saw dead people until I was... The uh, first person that I saw dead was when I was about 14. No, I was 16. Um, a friend of mine worked in a morgue, a mate of mine, Darren Fredericks, Freddo. 
and uh, say he used to like in the evening like say do you want to come and see some dead bodies and we would go into the morgue and check out some corpses now and then and that was my first experience of seeing dead bodies it's how we found our entertainment on a Friday night and uh, so but, but I, I hadn't seen a, a corpse before that but I had seen dead animals and most of us have at least seen dead animals and I remember seeing once a badger and it like that was more fascinating than most dead animals because it was bigger right you know what I mean? It's like, hey, this is big. And so I did what every child does when they see a dead animal. Okay, I got a stick. Okay, you know what's coming, don't you? And I prodded it. That's what you do. In fact, there's a few of us, we all had our sticks. And we were trying to kind of lift it up and you know, try and see what was going on, poking the eyes and all sorts of disgusting things. And um, it stunk. It's like, oh, it, was, it had been dead a while. And as we lifted it, we managed to lift it because it was like turned over. As we lifted it, it was riddled with maggots. It was disgusting. It was, and some of its skin, because the fur had fallen out in certain parts, was like, you could, it looked like it was alive with the rot. I think it's a horrible thing. You've probably seen something like that before. But it says here, you, we were dead. Okay? like that badger was dead like the people in the morgue that i saw were dead now here's the thing okay about dead things dead things are rotten and they're rotting on the inside this badger was full of maggots it was it there was a stench and god is saying you were like that every unbeliever outside Every unbelie our family members, friends, are like it. That's what, as far as God's concerned, it's a stench. What do you do? What happens to a badger that's in the middle of the road? Hopefully, at some point, someone comes and clears it up. It gets picked up and maybe incinerated somewhere, right? But, you know, that, that's it. That's the future of the badger. You were dead. You were rotten, stinking in the eyes of God. Not only that, a badger is a fairly dangerous creature when it's alive, right? You prod a badger with a stick when it's alive, you, you'll regret that, okay? If it feels cornered, you will seriously regret it. But when it's dead, it can't do anything, nothing. It can't do anything at all to help itself. What God is revealing to us here, he's telling us, that before all of us were once like that, helpless, we were just rotting on the inside. There was, on the inside, on the outside we might have looked okay. Sometimes a dead animal can still look fairly impressive for a little while. But on the inside, there was rot. And you know, that's true for every believer and unbeliever, even now. Okay? So. Uh, 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 the, the illustration of maggots is a good one. I've used it before, you may remember, but I got it from a man called C.H. Spurgeon. He says that all people by nature are full of maggots. Full of maggots, rotten on the inside. Look good on the outside, polished up and do the, do, ladies do their makeup and men have a shave and sort themselves out. But on the inside, we're full of rot. And some people have got thicker skins than others. And all that means is some people, you never really get to see the rot very much. They tend to look all right. But others, you've only got a poke in the right place and the skin breaks and out come the maggots. Just like that, out come the maggots. Anger, resentment, jealousy, foul language, hatred, lust. All sorts of things, right? Yeah. All of us, it's true for us, isn't it? That there's a certain amount of rot in us. And if someone cuts our skin in the right place, you know, they've only got to say a certain thing, do a certain thing, out comes the rot. You've probably seen a bit of it come out of me at times. I've seen it come out of some of you at times. It's true, isn't it? And we've seen it in others. We've seen it in our spouses, if we're married, right? Seen it in one another, out comes the rot. You've only got to say something and uh, full of maggots. You were dead. 
You were dead in your tra transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Here's the other thing it tells us. When you followed the ways of this world. Okay? A lot of people, they're like, and, and I, me, myself, is probably true for you. One of the, the reasons why we don't want to be Christians is because we want to be in charge of our own lives. Right? I want to decide. I want to do what I want to do. But what God has revealed to us here is that when we are, before we were believers, we didn't really do what we wanted to, we just followed. Everyone is a follower. Either they're a follower of the world and it's got all its dazzling lights and its temptations and what happens is people are dutifully following after. It's like they've got chains, they've got to go and do this and they've got to go and do that and otherwise their lives are incomplete. And they're just following the world, it's following its values, following its pursuits. It dangles money in front of them, they're like, oh, or whatever else it dangles and they're after it, following it, right? We were just followers of this world, it says, but not just that. So we were dead in sins. In God's sight, we were rotten, we were filthy. And we were absolutely helpless. We could do nothing because we were dead. Absolutely nothing. Couldn't respond even to God. We followed the ways of this world, but not just that, it says, and of the ruler of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Actually, it says in the um, NIV, in all those who are disobedient, but in the Greek, it says in the sons or the children of disobedience. And in other words, not only do we follow the world, not only were we dead, but we were followers, ultimately, of Satan himself. We were <coughs> followers of Satan. And that is why it says, it says, like the rest, we were by nature, again, NIV puts it this, deserving of wrath, but the Greek says, children of wrath. We were by nature children of wrath. In other words, God's fury and anger, we were ripe for it. We were ripe for God's anger, every one of us. We were in trouble. We were in serious, serious, serious trouble. There was a bomb ticking over our lives and we didn't even know it. And the truth is, most of us, even as believers, we minimise all this. We forget about it. But the scriptures here are absolutely clear. God is going to judge the whole world. And listen, he is going to vent the full, full weight of his fury and anger upon the people of this world. And here's the thing, the world needs it. Needs it. If you, you know, think about the wickedness of this world. This world, it is a wicked place. This is one of the problems with at least atheistic evolution. I say atheistic, we've got Chris sitting here and he might take me to task if I speak about evolution. But, so, but atheistic evolution, okay, certainly. Yeah, if you take God out of the picture, here's the problem with it. This is how you know that atheistic evolution certainly isn't true. I'll tell you how you know. Because the world would be a much better place. You know, think about it. If we've had all this time and we are advancing and humanity is advancing, by now it should be a lot better. Well, shouldn't it? Think about it. If we're really getting better and better, we're growing and we're advancing, this world should be much better. I mean, let's face it, right? We all know, everyone knows, that a world without war is a better world, right? We know that. We're not doing it, are we? Not even close. We, we, we know that, we all know, the whole world knows, there's enough food in the world to feed everyone. There's people starving. 
right now, they're behind closed doors, and I'm talking all over the world, all over the world, everywhere, behind closed doors, children are being abused in the most unthinkable ways. Everywhere, all over the world, right now, as I speak, it's happening. This is the world we live in. All over the world, right now, there are cartels and that, and they're involved in, in growing and supplying drugs en masse, heroin, crack cocaine, crystal meth, and lives are being devastated everywhere. All over the world, everywhere. All over the world, women and children are being trafficked, and men and boys, everywhere. At, at every single level, we live in a wretched world. And it deserves the wrath of God. And we might say, well, that's them, that's not us. Well, we're a part of it. We are a part of that world. Or we were. We followed it. We threw our lot in with it. We were following the ways of the world, the same as everyone else. We were following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And by the way, anyone that doubts that there really is a Satan, again, think about it. We want peace in this world. You, you do a survey, how many people want peace? And yet there is, there is none in our families in the world. And I was talking about evils in the world. It goes at that, you know, from behind closed doors and the illegal stuff. What about the legal stuff? Here's a legal sin in the eyes of God. One nation points torpedoes and missiles against another and blows up hospitals and all sorts. Or they flout the law. But within the law, you're, you're allowed to go to war. Uh, all of us, it says, lived among them at one time. We were by nature objects of wrath. And how do we know that God will pour out his wrath? He's going to do it. How do we know that? Well, because he's already done it. <coughs> he poured out his anger upon Jesus. Didn't he? His anger at this world and, and at us being followers of this world... He poured it all, all of his anger. He punished Jesus because of the sin of the world, it says. Well, I better move on because we've already, we're already 27 minutes in. You know, I, when, it, when it comes to God's wrath, what we were under... The, we were under the, not the threat of that. Okay, look, don't, it's easy to sort of misread what it says. It says, all of us lived among them at that time. We were by nature children of wrath. It tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, most of us will know the verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But it tells us that whoever does not believe in him stands condemned or remains condemned. In other words, our default position is one of condemnation. That is it. That's the default position under the condemnation of God. And God, because we've been part of this wretched world, and God has made a way for us to be forgiven. And that is why preaching the gospel is so important. But it goes on, doesn't it? So like the rest, we were by nature objects or children or deserving of wrath. And we know that God is going to do it because he's already done it. But here's the thing, how we know he's going to do it because he's already done it? If, if God was willing to punish his own son for our sin, for the sins of the world, then why on earth do we imagine that he wouldn't punish us if we don't repent? You know, he loved his son with an, a, an eternal love. And yet he punished him. Okay. 
but we go on. So like the rest, we were by nature deserving of, of wrath. Uh, yeah, I tweeted when I, when I prepared this, and here's what I tweeted. This is to all my pastor mates. I think Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3 is the most terrifying verse in the whole Bible. I think it probably is. But the, my next tweet was this. I think Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 is the most wonderful verse in the whole, on the, in the whole universe, I said. Because this is what it says. It tells us this stuff about the way that we were. But then it says, but because of his great love for us. So God's wrath upon us doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. He just means that he doesn't turn a blind eye to our sin. He's not like a goofy sort of dad that overlooks their child's misbehaving, never does anything about it. A weak father. He's not like that. He will punish sin because he is just and righteous. But he loves us. And he doesn't want to punish anyone for their sin. And that is why he punished Jesus. So we read in verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. So it tells us, there's those two things. He has great love for us. He has great love for us. Even when we were sinners. You know, as a child of God, maybe sometimes you struggle with, does God really love me? Can he really love me? Well, if he loved you then, if he had great love for you then, he has his love for you now. You need not doubt it. Because of his great for love, the love for us, God who is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. People need to know that. They need to know that God is, he is a, he's got loads of mercy. You know, if you, you, you can't measure it. His, his mercy is abundant. Absolutely, absolutely super abundant. Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, so he's just ready there to pour out mercy. What did he do? Made us alive. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. You were dead, but God saw us in our deadness. And as vile as we were, made us alive. He did something about it. He did something about it. Not us. Were it left, were we, if God left us to ourselves, we would still be like that badger. And we would, and one day that bomb would go off and it's all too late. If it wasn't for God. We, we, we cannot pull ourselves up by our boot strings. We were dead in our sins, but God made us alive. He did it. This is his doing. And he did it by grace, by grace you have been saved. Think of what you've been saved from. When God judges, he doesn't just, he judges as individuals and the Bible says he will reward each one according to what they have done. But also he judges as a community. So as part of the church, as a true believer, it's the church that gets saved. It says it in Ephesians chapter 5. He laid down his life for the church. And so as part of the church, it's a whole community gets saved, okay? And we're a part of that saved community. But in the same token, the world gets judged. And that is why it's not enough to say, well, I wasn't that bad when I was in the world. No, you're a part of it. That's the problem. You were fighting on the wrong side. But because of his great for us, love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Now, where it says it is by grace you have been saved, you've got a full stop. Then it says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Well, better translations like the ESV, they translate it slightly different. You don't, there's no full stop because it's one clause or, or, 
one part, two clauses of, of the same sentence. And God, so it says, it is by grace you have been saved and raised up with him. Okay, this is when God saved us, he raised us up and seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now just think about that. Okay, we went from being a dead badger to being seated in the heavenly realms with Christ. Now that hasn't happened yet for us in time, but the reason why this speaks in past tense, this has already happened, is because as far as God is concerned, if we put our trust in him, we have been not only saved, but are, we are already there. As far as God is concerned, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Isn't that good news? This, is, this should give us assurance Maybe you struggle with assurance. Listen, if you have put your trust in Jesus, you may have sinned and messed up big time. But when you first put your trust in Jesus, he seated you. And that is going to happen. And how do we know it's going to happen? He is going to make sure it happens. So we can rebel. We can go our own way. We can sin and we can say, God, I'm turning my back on you. Sooner or later, we'll come back because God has said, no, you belong to me. None, Jesus doesn't lose any whom the Father has given. Not one. Isn't that good news? So we've gone from being, we, we were dead, but now we've been seated in the heavenly realms. Just two applications for us. There's others that we could have, but two. The first one is this. Do you ever spend time contemplating the reality of your state before God saved you? Do you ever think about where you would be going and what that means had he not intervened? Do you, do you stop and take it in and pray and ask God because if you don't your faith will be very superficial very superficial it's a funny thing that in many churches they don't preach like I've preached this morning and the reason is because they want to tell you about the love of God but it, it's counterintuitive really it, that they it works against what they're trying to achieve in the end because we can't appreciate what God has done if we don't know the depth of his love for us. And so if, you don't, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not in awe and wonder of God very often, if you're not blown away by his grace, if you're not saying, Lord, I just want to lay down my life for you, if you don't find, then maybe it's because you just don't stop and think. And I want to encourage you, meditate. Think about what you've been saved from. These aren't, these aren't just fancy words here in Ephesians. This is the Apostle Paul telling us the truth. That's the first application. The second, so think about it. The second application is if this is true, then we must tell those who are still dead. Mustn't we? How can we keep this to ourselves? We know the, the state that they're in. How can we not tell them? Sometimes we, we, we're reluctant to speak and tell people the truth. Why? Well, because we don't want to lose them as friends or we feel like it's impolite and we know that they'll think certain things about us. Well, what if, so we don't, we're not honest, we're not upfront, we're not truthful about things, so we don't tell them. And then the bomb goes off. You know what I'm saying? Does it really matter? Yeah, what's more important? Yeah, there's the problem of the relationship, but there's a bigger problem. And we must tell people. And we want to love people and care for people in every way. But especially their eternal well-being. And it's not that one, one's necessarily more important than the other, but one is temporary, the other is eternal. And that is what makes it important. It's eternal. And so I want to encourage us... Together as a church, remember Paul's writing as a church, we're the people of God, a people of God. Let's encourage one another. Let's pray together that we might be bold 
that we might make him known. Let's pray.